Praising like you mean it. According to a recent article in the Religious News Service, for some pastors, the past year was a sign from God it was time to quit ministry. Already stretched thin, these clergymen found the demands of the pandemic from producing video church to combating conspiracy theories to all the joy, uh, took all the joy out of the job. The article tells a story about two pastors. The first was a man named Jeffrey Weddle, a 46-year-old, wise-cracking, Bible-loving, self-describing, uh, uh, failing pastor from Wisconsin who was already thinking of leaving the ministry before COVID and the 2020 election. Weddle was, as the article put it, fed up with the church life after two decades of pastoring. Then what he referred to as the stupid feuds about po politics and the pandemic that were taking place among Christians put him over the edge. People at the church seem more concerned about the latest social media's dust up and online conspiracy theories. One church member even called him an antichrist because of his views on COVID-19, which was that Christians should take the vaccine in order to protect themselves and those around them. For that, for that, he was called the devil. Other church members discussed privately among themselves that the pastor was trying to force them to get vaccinated against their will because he would bring it up so frequently out of concern for their health. The article went on to say that the last 18 months or so have been difficult for pastors like Waddle, already uh, stretched with day-to-day uh, -day concerns of running a congregation at a time when organized religion is in on, on the decline. They've increasingly found that the divides facing the nation have made their way inside the walls of the church. As a result, the article states that many pastors have felt a sense of isolation, cut off from contact with their congregations and unable to do their kind of in-person ministry that drew them to the pastorate in the first place. Instead of preaching and visiting the sick, they had to become video pr producers and online content creators. The second pastor of the article discussed uh, was named Brandon Cox, who's also 46, who stated that serving as a pastor had been a joy until earlier last year, before the pandemic. In 2011, Cox and his wife, Angie, started a new church in Bensonville, Arkansas, called Grace Hills. Cox described Grace Hills as a celebrate recovery style congregation inspired by the support group ministry founded at Saddleback Church in Southern California where Cox had once worked. Up until 2020, we had a fantastic time, Cox said. He told the Religious News Service in a phone interview, the trifecta of the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020 election, and the racial reckoning in response to the death of George Floyd hit, the, hit like a wrecking ball. Grace Hill shut down in-person worship at the beginning of the pandemic, which prompted people to leave. More left when the church reopened and required mass. When Cox and his black pastor preached a Sunday sermon together after Floyd's death and said that, yes, black lives matter, that caused more turmoil and more white people quit the church. No matter what Cox did, someone was angry. It was sort of relentless, said Cox, who stepped down as pastor at Grace Hill at the end of April of 2021. He said, my wife and I just found ourselves in the place of exhaustion. Cox talked to Religious News Service nine days after his last Sunday as a pastor and said he hasn't given up on Christianity. He hopes to find a new church to attend in the coming months, but pastoring ministry is no longer for him. In order to put this article into perspective, a life away church poll found that the average tenure of a pastor, meaning the time they last in the church, today is currently three years and six months. Another alarming pattern, the number of pastors who leave the ministry on a regular basis. In fact, the statistics here seem a bit horrifying. Let's take a look at a few. 80% of seminary and Bible uh, school graduates who enter full-time ministry will leave the ministry as a profession within their first five years after seminary. About 1,600 ministers are fired or forced to resign from their pulpits every month in the United States. 
More often than not, it is not always because they have done something wrong. For every 20 pastors that go into ministry, only one of them retires from ministry. In other words, only 5% of all pastors will begin and end their career in a local church. So the question is, what causes pastors to leave their church prematurely to either go to another church or leave ministry altogether? The answer is simple. The mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual demands of pastoring make it the hardest job on this planet, bar none. Jeff Waddle and Brandon Cox are real-life examples of just how difficult, but they are only two of many examples, not only in America, but worldwide. Based on the current state of the Christian church, congreg congregations have to encourage their pastors to keep their hands up, to stay the course, to stay on the job, to let them know that what they're doing matters and that they're making a difference for the kingdom. Amen? As we continue the series, God's People and the Trials of Exodus, we find ourselves today in Exodus chapter 17. Give you a little bit of background on Exodus chapter 17. It records two additional provisions by God for his people. Water, verses 1 through 7, and victory in battle, verses 8 through 16. God was demonstrating that he is capable of nourishing and sustaining uh, his people and all those who belong to him. After the nation left the desert of sin, they camped at Rephidim. Parched from their journey and finding no water in the oasis, the people again complained against Moses and blamed him for taking them out of Egypt. This was worse than their murmurings and plainings of, of distrust at Marah in chapter 15, verse 24, or in the desert of sin in chapter 16, verse 2. For here they had quarreled with Moses uh, in this particular chapter and were about to stone him until God intervened. Could you imagine you're trying to do your best as a pastor and the people want to stone you for doing your job? Could you imagine being Moses? Responsible for two million souls. That's how many people he was responsible for. Because remember I told you at the beginning of this series that when they went down to Egypt, there were only 70 in number. It was about 72. And Joseph was already there. And God sent them down there because God knew there would be a worldwide uh, pandemic going on where be starvation in order to preserve them through that famine and everything that was going on there God sent them down to Egypt and while they were in Egypt and going through all that they went through and the 400 years that they were there God grew them from 72 into 2 million so by the time they left there are 2 million people and God called Moses to be his human instrument to take them from bondage in Egypt to meet him at Mount Sinai and then from Sinai into the promised land. Do you know that it would only have taken them two weeks on foot walking, two million people to go from Mount Sinai to Mountain of God where they met God and got the Ten Commandments until they got to the promised land? But how in the world did two weeks take 40 years? Two weeks became 40 years. Because of lack of distrust and obedience to God, they stay stuck where they are or where they were because of it. Do you realize that some of you all are stuck? Because you violate the same principles they violate. Because you're just not all in. You have not committed yourself all in because you're not where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. And because of that, God can't count on you because you're not count. It is no way that he can count on you because your availability is God's opportunity. But you lack availability. God is not going to make you serve him just like he's not going to make you get saved. He would strongly encourage you to do so, but he won't make you. That's a heart problem. That's a heart issue. Because when you love the Lord, nobody has to make you follow him. Nobody has to make you give him your best, give him your all. Nobody has to make you do that. Amen? 
Since the time, of Mo, since the time Moses accepted the responsibility of God's call on his life at the age of 80 and returned to Egypt in Exodus in chapter 5, he became the most, it, be, it became the most challenged preacher in the Old Testament, if not the entire New Testament as well. Moses had the unique responsibility of leading too many grumbling, mumbling, complaining people uh, throughout the, the wilderness. His job was to lead these ungrateful people, again, from Egypt to Mount Sinai and to the Promised Land. In the end, these people did uh, add a lot of stress and anxiety to Moses' life. You can only imagine. And if God didn't keep him, because they didn't have care now facilities in the desert, they, he couldn't go to the emergency room. They didn't exist. He couldn't go to the hospital. He didn't have a primary care physician. There was no pharmacy. You know, we can get some meds. If God didn't keep this man, because all the anxiety and the pressure he took, because all Moses wanted was the people of God to enjoy God the way he enjoyed him. All Moses wanted was to help them know the Lord and to walk with him. And be faithful. That's all he wanted. And because that's not what they wanted. And Moses knew the consequences of what was going to come upon, the, upon God's people because they would not obey. And that gave him anxiety. You could imagine how many nights and days that Moses was in tears about these people. Because he took his job serious. Anyone that has been called by God to undertake the awesome role and responsibility of a, a pastor can relate to what Moses went through. Pastors often feel the weight of the world on their shoulders, and when they cannot seem to get God's people motivated about God's plan for their lives, the load is even heavier. Every pastor takes this role seriously. That's why so many of us quit. And many of them that quit, they don't want to quit. They just can't get you all to go along with them. And it becomes harder and harder because you say you will, but then you won't. Because actions speak louder than words. Amen? So today we're going to talk from this subject. Pastor, keep your hands up. Pastor, keep your hands up. Pastor, keep your hands up. Amen? The beginning of Exodus, chapter 17, reads this way. This is water from a rock. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by the stages of the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now they've been traveling. They've been in the desert. The little bit of water they had, it was gone. Now they're thirsting. They did not believe that the same God who had brought them out, who had been feeding them, he had been given the man and quail, and now they ran out of water because every place they go, they need water. But they, they fail to realize that God never sends you anywhere he don't provide for you. If God has indeed sent you where you are and you're right where he needs to be, you to be, he always provides for you in what you need in that location. Now, if you're where you ain't supposed to be, then that's another story. But if you exactly follow his plan and purpose, then God has promised uh, to make a way for you. As I often say here at Agape, if you do things according to God's plan, then God picks up the tab. If you want to do it your way, you have to pick up the tab. Amen? But they fail to realize that the same God had brought them out and brought them this far would, would see them and keep them through. Exodus 19 and 2 indicates that Rephidim as the final stop before the Israelites arrived at Sinai. It is located near Horeb, another term for the Mount of Mount Sinai. Verse 2 said, Therefore the people called with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? In other words, why, why haven't you trusted him? Each time you're not trusting him, you're testing him. And the Bible talks about not putting God through a foolish test, does it not? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up out from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with, with thirst? Moses is not the one who brought them out there. 
They complain to the wrong person. Moses is just the minister. He's just the vessel. He's just a pastor. But when things don't go right in your life, we often try to find somebody to blame. Amen? We can offer every possibility for you to learn and grow and teach you, and then you complain because you're not spiritually growing. Well, that's not on the leadership of agape. That's on you. Amen? If you're still not growing. Because all we can do is invite you to come to Sunday school. That's all we can do is invite you to join us on Bible study on Zoom. That's all we can do. Can't make you. Can't make you. All we can do is invite you. All right? But I want you to know, I want you to know you're still responsible for the content of what's discussed. When you miss church, you're still responsible for the content of what's, what's discussed. Amen? Because God didn't make technology easy because you can go to the website and you watch this sermon again. Amen? He said, to kill me and my sons. Language similar to Exodus 15 when they said, have you not brought us out here to kill us? That's the last thing. Could you imagine? You're trying to help your child and your child keeps screaming at you, you're trying to kill me? You don't love me? You're trying to take me out? How would that make you feel as a parent? Not too good. It'd make you feel like you failed somewhere. Because after all that you've done for this child, and this child has to fix their mouth to say you don't care. This is how Moses would have felt. The elders of Israel, the tribe, these were the tribal leaders. This is this rod that he had, the same rod that he had struck the Nile with. Verse 4 says, so Moses cried out to the Lord. What did Moses do? He went to God. I'm going to tell you that you won't survive in the role of pastoring unless you are a prayer warrior. Amen? You will not survive. You will not survive. Because you're praying every day, all day long for something or someone as well as your own family and yourself. Amen. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall uh, I do to, to this people a little more and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Go before the people instead of reacting with anger. God will show his power after he gives the law to the Israelites at Sinai. God will exhibit far less patience. In other words, see, up until this time, God showed them a level of grace. He was more patient. But watch what he does after he gives them the law in chapter 20 of Exodus. Because it's one thing that you don't know any better. But it's a whole other area when you know better, but you won't do any better. Remember the Apostle Paul uh, taught us this principle. Remember in the New Testament, when Apostle Paul comes on the scene, he's known as Saul. And he's ravaging the church. He's going out, locking Christians up. To, he didn't kill them personally, but he was having them locked up. To have them killed all because they were Christians. Paul was part of that movement until he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, got knocked off his horse and blinded. Remember that? Right. You know what Paul says later when he's recounting these stories about what he had done? He said God has shown him mercy. God has shown him grace. He says, why? He said, because I did what I did in ignorance. It's one thing to do something because you didn't know any better. But it's a whole other realm when you know better, but you won't do any better. Amen? Because now you've been made aware that this violates God's commands. This is why some people don't want to listen to a sermon, don't want to go to church, don't want to listen online, because they have already decided, I don't want to be convicted. I'm not following that anywhere, so I don't even want to hear it. However, you're still guilty for it. When we go out in this neighborhood, we've been in this neighborhood. We purchased this building over oh, five years ago. That's how long we've been in this neighborhood. We've given out over 3,000 flyers, door hangers, since we've been here. It's probably closer to four now, somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000. What that means is we actually knocked on three, 4,000 doors. Knocked on a few more yesterday. Amen. One day, somebody who lives in this neighborhood that we knocked on their door is going to have to stand before God to be judged. And they're going to tell God, God, I didn't know. God's going to say, well, that was a church that did not exist in that community, and I put them there, and they were called Agape Community Fellowship. 
And I put them there so you can have a church in your community that's somewhere where you can reasonably drive to. But you turned your nose up. You threw that flyer in the trash. And everything I would have taught you in that place, you never learned because you never took the invitation. But it wasn't the church inviting you. It was me because it's my house. And because you turn it down, then I'm going to judge you for everything you would have learned in that place. That's how serious this is. So you can go to a church where they're teaching bad stuff and false stuff. Anybody can go there. God's not going to hold you accountable in that way for that. But he will hold you accountable this way for this when he's teaching you the truth and you won't do any better. Amen? He didn't say amen and say ouch. It says, verse 6, And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Wow. How can you walk with God and then you question whether or not that he's with you? The reason why you can't feel his presence is because you're sinning. In Nehemiah 18, he says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. If your strength is gone, so does goes your joy. And if your joy is gone, go, so goes your strength. Give you an example. You ever had those days when you're really physically not ill? You don't, you're not ill physically, but you feel that way and you talk yourself into that. And then you don't go anywhere. Probably won't even take a shower. We'll get yourself dressed. You probably won't get up. You probably won't do any of that because your mind has told you there's something wrong, even though there's not, at least not physically. But what the problem is, is a spiritual problem that you seem to don't want to do anything about because you cannot enjoy the peace of God if you don't walk with God. You cannot enjoy the peace of God if you don't trust God. Amen. Life is full of valleys and hills, difficulties, high praises, low valleys. Life is full of all of that. But when you really, really, really know him the way he wants us to know him, guess what? You can praise him in the dark as the same way you praise him in the light. Amen. Amen. You know, you, you can praise him still during the difficult time. And some of y'all, it might be difficult for you right now, but you keep getting your praise on because you know God is not through with you yet. Amen. I've seen him come through too many times for me to give up now. Amen. He has been a good God. He's been awesome to me all the days of my life, even before I start walking with him as I reminisce and I think back to what he had done and how he preserved me because he knew what he had called me to do. And even when I was out there acting like a knucklehead, guess what? He did not extend to me all the sense of punishment that I should have gotten at that time because he showed me grace. And now that I've seen his grace, why would I want more of his grace? So as I've seen his favor and I've witnessed his favor, why would I not want all of his favor all the time? It's an oxymoron to call yourself a part-time Christian. You may not call yourself that, but your lifestyle tells God that's what I am. But see, God didn't save you to be a part-time Christian. He didn't save you to be a 911 Christian. They only call on when you're in trouble. And he definitely didn't call you to be a secret agent Christian. In other words, nobody else can tell. You're in hiding. You're on a special mission. <laughs> nobody needs to know. But everybody should know. If you're truly a child of God, everybody should know that. Should they not? Amen. And so God provided water from a rock. Because I want to focus on these last eight verses, these last verses. But that's what happened in the beginning. And so God had provided them water. And now we get to another part of this text. Where. It's like when the Amalekites attack. The Israelites encountered their first opposition. This is verse 8. From other people since arriving in the wilderness. The Amalekites apparently interpreted the appearance of the Israelites as a threat to their territory and resources. 
Because when two million people show up in an oasis, guess what? Somebody's not going to get some water. Somebody's not going to get some food. Amen? Something's going to be different here. So, of course, the Amalekites attacked them is what ended up happening. And so, as we look a little closer at this text, here's what I want to give you from this text. As we look at these verses, the question I have for you is this. It says, in order for a pastor to keep his hands up to fight the battle, the battles the enemy throws at him, what must the church have? Right? Remember, the church is not a church by itself because it has a pastor. What makes a church a church because it has a pastor and a congregation. Now, here's the thing. The pastor is not more important to God than the congregation. In fact, I would submit to you they're equally important. The only difference is between me and you is function. That's it. I'm not more important to God than you are. And I know some churches, they teach something different. They put pastors on pedestals and tell them, hey, they, they better, you know, than, than the, the person that sits on the last pew in the, in the church. That's not true. Because all of us have a value and worth and we're important to the kingdom. All of us come to faith in Christ, maybe on different days. Maybe God used a different person, but all of us come to faith in Christ the same way. In other words, we have to admit that we're sinners and accept him as a savior. Amen. We have to admit that. And if we're not willing to admit that. Then we can't be saved. If we can't confess that. And so what, what are some things that the church must have in order for us pastors to do our job? In order for us pastors to, to be committed to the ministry that God has called us to do? Well, the first thing that this text teaches us is that chosen people of God who are going to help carry the load. That's the first thing we find in this text. There has to be chosen people of God who are willing to help carry the load. I'm going to tell you why pastors get burnt out. Because not enough people are carrying the load. Have you ever been felt burnt out in your own house? Because you do everything where everybody else in your house do barely a little up to nothing. You wash the clothes, you take out the trash, you do everything, you get everybody up on time. You try to keep everybody straight, you become the referee, the counselor, everything else. And even though, although there might be another adult in the house, you don't get the help. And your kids should be of age by now, they should know better and they should do better, but they won't. They won't do any better. And that puts that weight on you. That puts that weight on you where you're like, wait a minute, I can not handle this. I feel like throwing in the towel. I feel like giving up. You've been there before. But the reason why you have not given up is because of your love for your family. And some people have given up because the stress was so great that it overshadowed the love for the family and they threw in the towel and left and gave up. Amen? So number one again, what should the church have? To help a pastor keep his hand, hands up so th that we can fight the battles the enemy throws at us. Number one, chosen people of God who are going to help carry the load. Look at verse 8. It said that Amalekite came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Of course, there's, with, first we had a water crisis that God solved. Now we have a crisis uh, where someone is attacking them. The Amalekite came and fought with, with them at Rephidim. This was an unprovoked attack by the Amalekites. In other words, Israel just going along minding their own business. But they didn't hit them from the front or the side. They were coward. They hit them from the back. 
They attacked them from the back. Deuteronomy 25 and 17 through 19 tells us that the Amalekites pushed a sneak attack and came up from the rear. As Christians, we must say, always say, watch and pray. That should be our job because we should be able to watch each other's back. That's what should happen. But if you isolate yourself and you don't hang around any other believers, then how can anybody watch your back? And then you're mad because the church that you belong to don't know you're going through that, but somehow you think they should know, but you didn't tell them. And you went through all of that. And that's all it took for the devil to get you to give up. It said he fought with Israel. The method of attack used by the Amalekites, Amalekites was despicable. Remember what Amalek did uh, to you on this way as you were coming out of Egypt how he met you this is Deuteronomy chapter 25 that tells about this story he attacked you from the rear ranks and all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and did not fear God this would have been devastating for them at this time verse 9 says so Moses said to Joshua choose men for us and go out and fight Amalek now you got to understand, all of these years up to this time, what's going on is that Moses is training Joshua to succeed him to lead the people. All right? So when Moses tells him, you choose men that are going to help us fight this battle. When Moses tells Joshua, he trusted Joshua to choose the right men. He didn't tell him which men. Other than since he told them, of course, godly men, mature men, but he left it up to him which men to choose. That means Joshua had to know the people. In order to make that decision, they had to know the people. See, the, unfortunately, there are people in church today, they want leadership responsibilities, but they don't want what goes along with that. They want the privilege, in other words, not the responsibility. They want to be called preacher. They want to be called deacon. They want to be called elder. But they don't want the responsibility to go along with the job. They just want the title. They want the title of head usher. They want, they want the title of being the senior deacon. They want those titles. But they don't want the responsibility uh, to go with, along with them. But Joshua knew these men. He knew these people. So he chose the right people. He said, tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. In other words, while you going down, I'm going up. Amen. Because the fight was down in the valley. But in order to be the instrument vessel, he had to go and be on a position uh, of authority where he can see. And he had the staff of God in his hand. The new Christian and sometimes older saints are amazed that the life of a believer is one of battles as well as blessings. Up until this point, Israel had not had to fight. The Lord had fought for them. But now the Lord chose to fight through them to overcome the enemy. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau and can illustrate the opposition of the flesh, which is Genesis 25, 29 through 34. The staff of God. The staff functioned in the case of this battle just as it had in the case of the plagues. The rod of God in my hand, the scripture says. The scripture called this uh, stout stick both the rod of Moses, because he says your rod, Exodus 17, 5, and the rod of God. There was the combination of the human instrument and the divine power. God called it the rod of Moses and so honored Moses. Moses called the rod of God, so honored God. So again, in order for a pastor to keep his hands up to fight the battles the enemy throws at him, what must a church have? The second thing a church must have is chosen people of God who are going to be obedient to the word of God. You can preach your best sermons. You can preach your best teaching. You still can't make people follow it. Amen? It has to be up to them to decide that I am going to be all in and I'm going to be committed to that. To the word of God in this place. Verse 10 said, Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the, of the hill. 
Joshua verses 9 and 10 are the first reference to Joshua in the Old Testament. He will become Moses' commander-in-chief and lead the Israelites' conquest of Canaan. Hur is a high-ranking leader. Hur would later be one of the leaders who assisted Aaron in governing the people while Moses was on Mount Sinai. Of course, he's believed to be uh, the husband of Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. So again, in order for a pastor to keep his, his hands up and fight the battles the enemy throws at him, what must a church have? The third thing a church has is chosen people of God who have spiritual discernment. Look at verse 11. So it came about when Moses held up his hands uh, that Israel prevailed, and when he, his hands went down, Amalek prevailed. Moses' hands became heavy. The job of supporting the battle in prayer was difficult, and Moses could not easily continue. We might think that fighting was the hard work and prayer was the easy work, but the true prayer was also the hard work. As long as the staff of God was raised high, just as the miraculous plagues and the miracles of the water from the rock immediately proceeding, God's uh, decisive role was uh, properly acknowledged symbolically and the army prevailed. When the staff was lowered because Moses grew tired, verse 12 makes it explicit, the Amalekites were winning. Thus, the staff portrayed God's sovereignty and the consequences of battle. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and, and put it under him. And he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sunset. Though this was Moses' work to do, it was more than he could do by himself. Moses alone could not win the battle of prayer. He needed others to come by, the side, by his side and strengthen him in prayer to get the work done. The staff had to be above Moses' head, symbolizing God's uh, superiority to all his people as the leader in a holy war. So when Moses became so tired that he could not keep it above his head long enough for the Israelites to succeed against the Amalekites, an intervention was necessary. The problem was not Moses' age or physical condition, because the Bible says he died a strong man. The problem was the fact that the human beings cannot keep their arms above their heads indefinitely, Anyone who would eventually tire under those circumstances. With Moses seated on a low stone and his hands held above his head by Aaron on one side and hair on the other, the staff could be above the height of his, his head because Aaron and her could keep their arms at a comfortable hanging height under Moses' elbows, probably with their fingers locked together, cradling his elbows. So, again, in order for a pastor to keep his hands up, to fight the battles the enemy throws at him, what must the church have? Number one, again, the church must have chosen people of God who are going to help carry the load. In other words, it has to be people who have a heart for Jesus, an obedient heart for him. Number two, chosen people of God who are going to be obedient to the word. Amen. Nothing bothers a pastor more than we spend our time studying to teach the word of God and the people of God won't follow the word of God. That's disheartening for us pastors. Because how do we know? Because you don't avail yourself anymore or you're sporadic in your availment. You, 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 you. Your whole life revolves around everything else. But you can't give God a little bit of time on a Sunday to give a message and, and praise him in song. That's not a focus for you. That's why you're not growing. And then you don't take the time to try to study the word of God with the people of God then that's another avenue you're losing that God is trying to teach you and stir you so you can discover what God's plan and purpose is for your life. So you can discover what your spiritual gifts are. Amen? And third thing again, chosen people of God who have spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is simply knowing what God would have you to do in any given situation. In other words, do I discern what God's plan is for me? 
In other words, can I tell the difference between what God's will is, what I want, what somebody else wants for me? Can I discern those differences? Because you always hear people say, God told me, told, told me to do this. And when you think through what they're actually telling you, you're like, God couldn't have said that. Because that violates everything about God's character. Amen. We once had a friend of ours who married her husband because the, the verse of scripture she used was Hosea. Serious. She married her husband because of the book of Hosea. Because God told Hosea to go marry a prostitute. So she said that she married her husband because God told him to do that. I said, no, you got it all twisted. Because you can't use that to say God told you to go do that because God had the divine purpose of why he told Hosea to do that because God will often take the prophet and use the prophet's life as a living example. In that case of a spiritual adultery. So God used physical adultery to explain spiritual adultery to the people. All right. In your case, you just lusted after this man, want to marry him. You should just say that. That you just want to marry him anyway, even though you know he wasn't saved. And hopefully one day he would be saved. Well, today he is. But that was no guarantee, though. And people use the Bible out of context because we're not good Bible scholars, Bible students. We don't know that they use it out of context. We don't know that. But if you know the Bible and what it says, the Bible says that we shall tread on scorpions and serpents and not be harmed. A minister friend of mine, recently, we were talking on the phone because he lives in a different part of Texas. And I said, did he get vaccinated? He said, no. He said, here's why. He, he quoted that scripture to me. I said, dude, you do realize you're wrong. That's not what that scripture means. And then I told him what it meant in context. Do you realize I talked to him again recently, last week, he still hadn't gotten vaccinated? His family hadn't gotten vaccinated? Something's wrong with that. Yeah, that kind of thinking. If you just don't want to do it because you don't want to do it, then just say that. To make up the excuses and lies to, do, to take that position, then that's a problem. Because the Bible said, let your yes be yes and your no be no because everything else is sin. You can make a decision. You can say, hey, I don't know enough. I don't trust. I don't know. I'm not comfortable with that. Then just say that. But then you must understand that whatever consequences become because of that, then that, that becomes on you and your family. Whatever consequences, if there be any. Amen. So here's the fourth point. It's the fourth and final point. In order for the pastor to keep his hands up, to fight the battles the enemy throws at him, what must the church have? The fourth thing it must have is chosen people of God who never forget what God has done for them. Look at verse 13 through 16. This is after God had given them victory over the Amalekites. And it's only because the intercession of Aaron and her understanding and then Joshua played a pivotal role because Joshua was down in the valley with the men actually fighting the battle. Amen. It says, so Joshua overwhelmed the Amalekites and his people with the edge of the sword. In other words, Joshua and the men he chose routed the Amalekites. Now, you got to understand something. The Joshua and the men with Joshua had never, ever been in a battle. They never been in a fight because up until this time, God had fought for them. The Amalekites were used to fighting. They had years of experience because they were often, they were nomadic people who hid up in the mountains. And when they saw some, an opportunity, especially two million people traveling on, when they came along, they know they got some stuff. And so they're, they're going to attack them. This, is, this was their normal mode of operation. They're used to fighting. So you can, you can say that they're professional fighters and soldiers. They had no experience. But here's why it matters when you're following the right person. And that person is following God. 
It doesn't matter what odds are stacked up against you. Amen. As long as you're on the right team. Because you can feel like you're by yourself. But do you realize God by himself is majority? All by himself, God is majority. Therefore, you by yourself and with God, you're majority. Because God is majority by himself. Because there's actually more with us than who are with them. Because of the armies of God, the angels of God that protect us. Amen. He said, write this down. The Lord said to Moses, write this in a book. This was so important that God told Moses to write it down and recite it to Joshua. For me more, why Joshua? Because God was telling him then that this man is going to succeed you if he didn't know it by then. That I will utterly blot out the memory of uh, Amalek from under heaven. Did you know that the Amalekites were descendants of Esau? Jacob's brother? These are their own relatives fighting them. How do you like when your relatives start fights with you? Some of y'all probably don't even go visit certain relatives because you know every time I go, it's going to be an argument. So it's better for me to just call them up on the phone and say, hey, from a distance. Because I just can't stand to be in the present with them because I don't like fighting. Because it always leads to fight and arguments and all that kind of stuff. As a result, it said Moses built an altar and named it the Lord is my banner. One, another one of God's divine covenant names. Amen. Moses built an altar, a sign of worship. The altar is a sign of worship. Oftentimes when you see patriarchs and people building altars, it was a sign of worship. It means Yahweh is my banner. The name of the altar is actually a divine title once again. This is God's covenant name, Jehovah Nissi, which again means the Lord is my banner. We have our victory not through our own efforts, but through Christ alone. This, this, this particular Hebrew word, if you've ever been in the military, you understand this, okay? In the military, when you, when you go out to battle or whatever your squadron or unit or company you have a banner or a flag on a pole with your company's name on it. All right? If you ever go to one of the, if you witness a graduation, a military graduation, or uh, there are times when you have a change of command, there's always a flag. All right? And what happens is people rally around the flag because flag represents who we are. Okay? Because what they rallied around was this was a signal pole. That means that God is my rallying pole. This is why I rally around him. That's what it means that the Lord is my banner. Amen. That I rally around him. Because a, a banner is a sign of a, or a flag. People hold it to display, uh, to show others their commitment. Amen. So when people see you, they should see a spiritual banner over your life. And your, the spiritual banner should say that the Lord is my Jehovah Nissi. Because I walk and live under his banner. Amen. Israel was delivered from the world, which was Egypt once and for all, by crossing the Red Sea. But God's people will always battle the flesh until Christ returns. How did Israel, Israel overcome the enemy? They had an intercessor on the mountain and a commander down in the valley. In other words, Moses on the mount, Joshua down in the valley. Moses' role on the mount illustrates the intercessory work of Christ. And Joshua with his sword illustrates the spirit of God using the word of God against the enemy. Which is Hebrews 4.12 that God's word is sharp and active in double-edged sword. Of course, Moses is an imperfect picture of Christ and his intercessory work since our Lord never wearies and needs no assistance. Moses alone on the mount could not win the battle, nor could Joshua alone on the uh, battlefield. Victory required both of them working together on one accord. Therefore, what you get the picture of is Moses is a picture of the pastor. Joshua, Aaron, and her are a picture of the congregation. Because without either of them, they get wrong by the Amalekites. 
It was because these four men were willing to work together in concert on one accord that God give them victory. Amen? The understanding that Moses' responsibility as the senior pastor, that they had to submit to the authority that God had given him. And they knew enough about Moses on how to support Moses. All right? I want to give you an illustration of what happened that day. Reverend Victor, Reverend Samson, Reverend Ingram, if y'all come forward. I want to show you what happened that day. Right? So when you read this text, from now on, I hope you get the magnitude of this text. So, I'm going to have Rem Victor, Rem Samson step down into the valley. Y'all in the valley, by the way. Y'all valley people. And, and we're going to have Moses come up. Come on, Moses. Moses. And Reverend Ingham is Moses, okay? Now, Take that with you for a second. Here, here is, is what happens. What happens is Moses knew the power of God and the symbolism was in this staff. This is the same staff that parted the Red Sea. This is the same staff that defeated all the gods of Egypt. All right, same staff. So Moses knew when he went up the mountain to talk to God, Moses knew that when he raised the staff, go ahead and raise the staff, he raised the staff of God over his head. The staff symbolized God's authority and God's power and his sovereignty over the situation. But what happened was that Moses' arms would get weary and tired. And eventually, the staff would be lowered. All right? Go ahead and lay it all the way down. And then he would muster up a little bit of strength again to get it back up, but not where it was. Because his arms are tired, he couldn't get it up there. And then he dropped it again. And he did it again and again. Now, these astute gentlemen, wise about beyond their years in wisdom, they saw correlation. They paid attention. Because remember, they're up the mountain, but not as high as Moses. They're not in the valley. The people in the valley, they come up part of the mountain, so they got a front row seat to see what's going on on the mountain and what's going on down in the valley. And so when they see Moses struggling, they say, I cannot have my pastor struggling because we see there's a correlation. We notice that when he held, hold his arms high, we winning. We got, we got victory. But we also notice when he lowers his arms, the Amalekites start hooking us up. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And so, but they both decided we need to support our pastor. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So they know that if they tried to do it in their own strength, then they know that they would fall victim to the same thing. Now, the rod of staff is not the weight of it. All right? You can't hold your hands up by yourself with nothing in them for too long. But holding a staff as long as this staff is. So it's going to have a little bit of weight to it. And hold it up in only a matter of time. Out of discernment of what's going on. And being able to see into the vision and things of God. They understood what Moses understood. Moses didn't have to say and give him this, you know, kind of funny eyed look. Like y'all better get up and help me. He didn't have to do that. Because they loved their pastor. They loved Moses. And they understood how difficult it was to deal with us and lead us. So they knew better. So they came prepared. Because Moses is not just holding up the staff and keeping his mouth closed. Moses is praying the whole time. Are you getting this? Moses is praying the whole time. And even when his arms got weary, he still was praying. 
but he knew that he should not have to always tell these other leaders that he needs help. Amen. They should discern that he needs help. Amen. And they should know better, and they should come forward and help without him having to ask. Amen. So guess what they did? They both came up. Bring your stool. They both came up, but they realized if we didn't bring some help, we're going to be in the same boat that he in. So what they did, the Bible said they brought a rock. And you know, oftentimes the Bible talks about the rock being Jesus. And he was able to rest on the Lord. Amen? And so they understood that this might take a while. So we got to keep his arms up. So what they did, they, he, they got, he's got up on the one elbow and the other on the elbow, and they interlocked their hands. So that they can rest in a comfortable position. So from that time on, that staff never came down. It never came down. Because as long as they lifted up the sovereignty and the supremacy of God in their situation, they had victory. I'm going somewhere with this. As long as you allow the sovereignty of God to reign in your situation, you'll be in victory. The moment that you lower your hands in defeat because you don't have anybody supporting you on either side, then you will be in trouble. Amen. That's why you cannot walk this journey by yourself. That's why you make it easy for Satan when you out there, mind your own business, won't, don't have no church, I don't need to go to church, making all those excuses, blame the pandemic, all those kind of things. Then you are just like Moses with his hands down. Amen. When you lift your hands up, you have to lift your hands up to the Lord. Amen. Go ahead and lift your hands up. Go ahead and lift your hands up to the Lord. But whoever's beside you, I want you to grab the elbow and help hold that hand up. Grab that person beside you and say, I'm going to help you hold that hand up. Because I know you get tired. Amen. I know life gets tough for you. I, I, I know that your situation gets overwhelming at times, so I'm going to be your prayer partner. Amen? I'm going to be your accountability partner. And I'm going to hold up your elbow as you hold up my elbow. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. I think they got tired for real. <laughs> now they might need a nap after church. Thank you, preachers. I just want to try to make it plain to you today. And I know we started off and I gave you some information about two pastors and how, why they quit ministry. The last thing you want to do if you take this serious is to walk away from it. Because it will crush you. It will break your heart to walk away from this position of pastoring because you don't seem to be doing any good. As I said before, and as I close Listen to this. I accepted my call to ministry about 30 years ago. So far, in these 30 years, I have been a God servant. In January of 2022, just around the corner, I would have been pastoring Agape for 19 years. And I must tell you that it has been 19 of the toughest years of my existence of 57 years of life. This is the hardest thing that I ever have done the hardest thing I've ever done. Harder than serving in the military for over 30 years. First as a cop, military cop for 10 years, and then 20 years and six months as a chaplain. Harder than being deployed in the Middle East for a total of 13 months of my life for on, on two separate deployments. Harder than enrolling in college and grad school or some military leadership school for almost 20 years. 
I spent about 20 years of my life in a classroom. But that was all easy compared to pastoring this church. Because what happens with us pastors who love God and who love God's people, when you don't see people respond, it breaks your heart every time. When you see people not where they're supposed to be and you cannot count on them, you don't know when they're going to be in, they know when they're going to be out because they don't tell you. You just know when they don't show up. When they won't come to Bible study, even though you spend your time studying, preparing, or getting one of the other Bible teachers here at the church to, to teach the lesson, and, but the people won't come get the lesson. That puts more pressure on us than you know. I know that to most of you all, I look very healthy. For the most part, I am. But I am a disabled vet for all my years, certainly in the military. I found out years ago that I have a heart condition due to all the years I had hypertension, high blood pressure. It seemed like every year my doctor's adding another medication for other issues and joint pain and all the stuff that I have. Amen. That pales in comparison to the spiritual pressure and emotional pressure that I face. Last week, between Tuesday night and Wednesday night, we could not get my blood pressure to come down. I was not running, I was not exercising, I was just sitting there working and looking at TV. Took a shower, lay down in bed about 1.30, my heart's still racing. I went back and checked my blood pressure again. It kept going up and up and up. Anytime you get to 175 over 100, that's some high blood pressure. For you all don't understand because you never had to deal with high blood pressure. And even though I had been taking my medication on time, I take it every day. And it concerned me. And I told Sister Noah we're going to have to go to the emergency room. So we got up and went to the emergency room. You go to the emergency room now, it's a little bit different. Because they allowed me to go in, she had to wait in the car. And then when they put me in a the room, then uh, the nurse said, hey, call your wife and have her come in. They ran all these different tests, hooked me up to all these different things. And so all, the, all those tests came back negative. And the thing that I deducted, what is driving up my blood pressure? The stress of leading this church. Before we started Agape, I never had hypertension. I was discovered hypertension back in 2010. Because I'm not a person who explodes. I try to keep my emotions in check. I try not to get too angry because I don't want to explode at people. But what happens is eternally it wears on me. Just like any other pastor. We don't know when I talked to my other pastor friends, what our church is going to look like when this pandemic is over. We don't know. Because for 19 years, this has been our church home. We started in our home 19 years ago. You can walk away and go find somewhere else and not go at all. We can't leave that easily because of responsibility that God has given us. But the less you do, the more I have to do. The less you do brings my arms down. I can wake up every day and put my arms up. But sometime before noon, my arms are coming down. Because I'm a doer. And I'm going to do and get things done. Because when you go home this evening, you're going to rest and do whatever you do. I sit down in a chair with my laptop and start working on all this week's stuff. Why do you think on Mondays you get a devotion? Why do you think on Mondays you get a Sunday school lesson? 
Why do you think on, on by Monday I try to get you out? All the things that you will need for this week and all the things the church will, because I have to stay up to do that. And I have to prepare my sermons early in the week because of all the things that go on that, that I don't know that's going to come. So I have a routine. I get up. Before the light comes up, I run in my neighborhood. I run two or three miles. If I don't run, I jog now. Joint pain don't let me go too fast. I have to do that because I have to keep my weight now. Because with hypertension, high cholesterol, on medication for that, if I don't do that, then it's going to affect my heart. And I want to be around all the years God is going to give me so that I can lead this church. But I'm telling you, after 19 years, I'm just not going to do this by myself anymore. I'm just not. You're going to have to step up. And you say, well, Pastor, how so? Well, your availability is God's opportunity. Amen. From one Sunday to the next, I don't know who's going to be here other than me and my wife. There's a few others that I know like clockwork. I can always count on you being here. We set up going out in outreach. I always know that who's going to be out, who's going to be there. And I appreciate that. But for right now, I just need you to be here. Amen. I just need you to be here. We took our booster shot about 10 days ago. So that was our third shot. And the reason why we took it is because with my conditions and Sister Noah's conditions, we couldn't afford to get COVID. And I'd rather take my chances with the vaccine than the virus. All those years I spent in the military, I got plenty of vaccines for all kinds of stuff, especially when you went overseas. I don't have a problem. I'm going to trust the doctors, my doctor. I'm going to trust them. I'm educated. That's not my lane, though. Amen. That's not my lane. So I'm going to ask someone that I trust who that is their lane. Amen. So I thank God for each of you. And I hope that today's message has hit you in a way that maybe these other sermons haven't. And again, everybody can do something. We sit on almost four acres here. We got more grass than buildings, at least right now. Somebody has to cut the grass. Somebody has to clean up church. Somebody has to do all of that. This stuff doesn't happen just because you show up and somebody behind the scenes, somebody has done it. Somebody has to do something. And I'm asking each of you to say, hey, I will help out in this way. I'll be committed in that way. As I take my seat, I introduced a term to you all a couple of years back of what kind of believers we want here at Agape. And so we came up with an acronym called Fat Christian. All right? Faithful, available, teachable, tithing team player. Faithful, available, teachable, tithing team player. Amen? In my house, every time we get a raise, God get a raise. In, in my house. Because God didn't have to be as good as he has been to me and my wife. Amen? He didn't have to bless us to both retire from the Air Force. He didn't have to do that. Amen? But he did. And there are benefits that came with that. And so... I realize and understand that equal giving is not possible because not everybody has the same amount of financial resources. But equal sacrifice is. Amen. Because we have to learn how to be faithful with God with our time, our talent, and our treasure. If you want to know what's important to people, all you got to do is look at the bank statements. 
because you see where the money goes. But a church cannot function without the people of God supporting the ministry of God. That's why we've never begged you here to God. Be. All we do is ask. And we will continue to ask and we will never beg. But at some point in your walk and in your life, you have to say, am I giving God my all? Am I giving God my best? Am I committed to a church? Am I committed to a God being? I hope so. I hope that you are. Because I would like to live a lot longer than be stressed out. I would like to. But I realize is I have to ask and strongly ask that you get on board. Again, your availability is God's opportunity. Simply being on time for stuff. Showing up to church on time for stuff. Showing up online for stuff. We won't always be online on Wednesday night. We eventually will come back and be here on Wednesday night. Amen? But we have more people online with us on Wednesday night than before the pandemic hit. Again, those are the concerns that pastors have. Because we want to make sure that you're growing and that you're learning and that we're growing and learning together. For those of you who are present with us, online with us, you want to partner with us, those of you who are present, those of you online, you can go to gopicommunityfellowship.org. You can go to our website. You can see this message again today, past messages on various topics and through the Bible. You can also contribute. And we'd ask that you would go and that you would contribute. We thank you for those of you who have been contributing to our general church fund as well as our mission fund that helps our missionaries, our Nigerian families. It helps them tremendously for its giving. And we're challenging you, as you can, that you give a little bit more. We want to help our Nigerian families uh, get their status with their visas. And that takes financial resources to help get that done. So we'll move mission funds money to where it needs to go so we can begin hopefully early next year that we'll be able to start pushing the process for one package and then the next package and then whatever packages after that we have to do. Your support matters. It don't just keep the lights on, but it does real ministry. Our ministry reaches around the world. I want you to know that. If you didn't know that, we have more people watching us online than we have present. And it happens every Sunday. So God has given us a global ministry since this pandemic has taken off. Amen. And we've utilized the technology with your help and your support and your giving has made a tremendous difference. So if you're with us online and you'd like to partner with us, just let us know. Reach out to us. We'd love to have you. Be part of our team here, our family, because we're a family here to God. We thank God for each of you. And we give God praise and honor all that he does in your life and all the resources and things that he does to provide kingdom work for you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before your God. We thank you for today. And Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who don't know you for the pardon of their sins, I pray today will be a day of salvation. And if you're here today or listening online and you cannot honestly say with 100% assurance, that Jesus Christ is your saving Lord. Without any doubt, then I want you to pray with me. I invite you to pray with me. To say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I accept you as my Savior. Because, Lord, when I die, I want to know for sure that I'm, I'm going to be with you. And right now, I might not be so sure. And I might have prayed this prayer before, but today I'm praying again. I heard you loud and clear. I realize I have not been giving you my all. And I realize that I make it much harder on my church family when I don't do my part. When I do my bare minimum. When I give everything to Caesar. And I'm so tired from giving everything to Caesar, I can't give much back to God. Lord, today I want that to change. 
So, Lord, I invite you into my heart, my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for saving me. And I give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory that you so rightfully deserve. Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As you, Joshua said to the people when he took over after Moses, he said in Joshua 24, 15, he said, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. But he went on to say, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I hope that is all of you listening today. That is your confession of faith that you would say with me, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it's in Jesus name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. And amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Before this, because of the sake of time, we're going to forego our closing song from Reverend Samson. And I just want to challenge you today. God will use you if you let him. I don't care where you're stuck. I don't care what your background is. You can turn to God and say, God, use me. Help me to be more faithful, available, teachable, tithing team player. Amen and amen. Let us stand for our benediction. As I was preparing this message, because this message was heavy on my heart, uh, my blood pressure didn't go crazy, but I could feel my heart. Because I knew that some words today that I had to say to you was going to be challenging to some of you. And it's not meant any way other than the fact that I just want you to know God better and to walk with him better. Because none of us have to be an orphan. None of us have to walk this journey by ourselves. God made us a family so we can walk as a family. We can live as a family. But it's up to us. It's up to you. You can, you can continue to be in, out, some days, in, out. That won't work for anybody. I'm just encouraging and inviting you to come be all in with us. Because we got a lot of work to do to finish out this year. We got a lot of work to do going in uh, to next year. One last reminder. Miss Maureen has asked the reason why you, you're wearing the ribbons today uh, because we're honoring breast cancer awareness. Our dear member, Sister Marine, she is 23 years survivor. Amen. She don't look like it. She's in her 80s, but she's thanking God every day. So next Sunday, she had her anniversary. It's 23rd, but on next Sunday, she's asking the members of Agape to wear something pink. Wear something pink on next week to honor this very important. Many women find out each day they have breast cancer. And there are women who pass away from breast cancer. We had two wonderful ladies in our church when we left and moved here in 98 who passed away in 98, both from breast cancer, some faithful servants of God all the way to the end. But it wasn't the end, it was just the beginning because they went on to be with the Lord. And we just want to honor and lift that up and just pray for all the women here and around the world uh, that have breast cancer. So we want to pray for them. Amen? Amen. We're going to ask you to depart to serve. We're going to ask you to go back and look at the internet. Go back to our website. And then you can look at past messages, this message. And I hope that it would challenge you. Because we sang about it earlier, I need you and you need me. We're a family. So let's do this together. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Depart to serve.